D'abord, j'aimerais vous accueillir au nom du CEPI, Centre d'études en politique internationale. Welcome you on behalf of CIPS, Centre for International Policy Studies, which is sponsoring this talk today. Some of you might only be expecting one speaker, so we have a special, you know, buy one speaker, get another one free. <laughs> so not only do we have Sarah Pantubiano, who was advertised, but also her colleague Samir al Harawi who also works for the Overseas Development Institute. So they'll be speaking today on UN integration and humanitarian space. Um, I guess I should say who I am, for those of you who don't know me. I'm Stephen Brown from the School of Political Studies, and I'm just chairing this session today. I'm especially happy to do so because I'm a fan of ODI. I've always liked ODI and the work that ODI does. You probably didn't know I was going to say this. But ODI is probably the most interesting think tank in the UK, um, and one of the most interesting in the world. And, and Obviously, that's subjective because it's for the kinds of things that I'm interested in, but it's really a pleasure to have them here at the University of Ottawa. They have a very busy schedule. They're, they met with DFAT this morning, they're meeting with CETA, they're, they're, they're here for only two days, and they're basically jam-packed, so we're really happy that they took the time to come talk to us here at the University of Ottawa. Just a few more words on who they are. Sarah has been working at ODI since 19, it was written no, no, 2006. 2006, okay. <laughs> she has extensive experience in Sudan, um, especially um, in humanitarian issues, and um, that informs her work. And um, Samir also is, you work in the same unit, don't yes. you? And he's a um, senior, a, a research fellow, um, and has been working for a long time too on humanitarian action. Um, conflict affected emergencies and focuses especially on humanitarianism and politics. So they're going to, I'm not sure exactly how they're going to manage it, they're going to move a bit back and forth between act. them, but um, they'll make a, a great tag team, I'm sure. So welcome. They'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time for about 40 minutes of, of um, Q&A afterwards. So over to you. Thanks, okay. Stephen. Just to say that the, the bit of ODI where both Samir and I work is the Humanitarian Policy Group. Um, for those who are not familiar with the, what HPG does, we basically carry out analysis on all sorts of areas related to humanitarian policies, policy and practice. We have a network of practitioners which is called Humanitarian Practice Network. So what the network does is actually publish the research of um, practitioners, policy makers, academics, others in our quarterly magazine that is called Humanitarian Exchange. So HPG publishes our material, the work we do as researchers of HPG, but HPN could publish your work. So if you're interested, in, if there is something that you think um, should be shared more widely, lessons learned from the field, something new, something that hasn't worked, I think should be disseminated more widely, send it to HPN and then look at it and provide the editorial support to make sure that it's more widely disseminated. Having said that, because it's always good getting more orders for <laughs> HPN, um, what we're going to uh, be presenting today is focus on the work that particularly Samir has done on humanitarian space. We had a, um, a project for the last two years that is focused on um, trying to understand and uh, you know explore the challenges related to the concept of, of humanitarian space and we have um, carried out the research through a series of roundtables that have explored different dimensions of uh, uh, the challenges to humanitarian space. So we'll present some of uh, the external challenges as well as the internal challenges and then open up um, this to discussion. All of this work is coming together finally into a report that will be released uh, I suppose in March. It should have been released here by now but it will come out in March. <laughs> so here, keep going. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, okay, well, with, as Sarah mentioned, we carried out a roundtable series last year. We carried out six roundtables, and each one focused on different dimensions of humanitarian space. And there's summaries of the roundtables on our website. So if you are interested in looking at the particular details from each um, roundtable, they are there for, for you to look at. But as Sarah mentioned, they will be all put together and put into a report, which should hopefully um, come out in March. Um, but just to kind of give you a flavor of some of the things that came out of the roundtable series and that will be in the report, one thing that we really try to do is challenge a little bit the dominant narrative on humanitarian space. Now, just to kind of outline what that narrative is, whilst there's many different definitions of what humanitarian space is, many humanitarian organizations like to invoke a humanitarian space for both affected communities and for humanitarian organizations to receive and provide assistance at protection. 
but at the level of policy and practice, most concerns about humanitarian space are actually predominantly about humanitarian agency access with relief often prioritized over protection. So it's very much about humanitarian organizations' ability to provide humanitarian assistance as opposed to um, affected communities' ability to receive um, 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 assistance and protection. Furthermore, humanitarian space is often seen as a space that is separate from politics. So hence, often there's a concern among humanitarian actors with the politicization of humanitarian aid. <clears throat> um, and that space outside of politics, that humanitarian space is deemed to be shrinking. So most discussions of humanitarian space will talk about the shrinking humanitarian space. <clears throat> with humanitarian organizations, particularly since 9-11, less able to reach populations in needs. And just to kind of highlight a little bit the, um, the, the narrative on this, I'm going to um, read out a short quote from an uh, Interagency Standing Committee background report from 2008. And the Interagency Standing Committee, for you that don't know, is basically a group for different UN agencies and NGOs that come together to discuss and make policy on humanitarian issues. Now, the, um, they basically claimed in 2008 that one of the most prominent manifestations and consequences of the shrinking of humanitarian space is the increasing insecurity of humanitarian staff. Other manifestations include the decreasing safety and security of beneficiaries and access to them. As a consequence of these significant changes, many of the assumptions that humanitarian organizations make and on which they base their work are becoming increasingly less relevant. Whereas in the past, uphold humanitarian agencies worked within a clear, solid and predictable model, namely that by upholding humanitarian principles of independence, neutrality and impartiality, an agency's access would be guaranteed. This basic tenant is now being challenged. So the implication is that if you avoid the politicization of aid and if you can uphold these humanitarian principles, you, we can return to a past era in which there was an increased humanitarian space. But we would like to suggest that this narrative doesn't really hold true. First of all, we don't think that there is a humanitarian space that exists separate from politics. So all humanitarian access is often based on political compromise, a compromise that is often largely dependent on the actions and interests of warring parties. And, and you can look back at history and very much even during the, um, the, sec um, the Second World War and the role of the ICRC was very much based on the particular politics of the time and states allowing those organizations to, to operate. And even if you take a cursory look at the history of humanitarianism, you'll never see really a golden age of humanitarian space. If anything, rather than seeing a shrinking of humanitarian space today, you could argue that agency space is actually expanding. There are more humanitarian agencies than before. There's more aid workers. There's more money that's being given by governments for humanitarian action. And there's much more awareness amongst the general public about humanitarian issues. In fact, the sovereignty of nation states are becoming contingent on upholding certain responsibilities, which is a radical shift from the Cold War where norms of sovereignty meant that few humanitarian organizations were actually able to access the heart of conflict zones. Um, in fact, you could, we would argue that it's the nature of the expansion of agency space that is at the heart of what we might call a crisis of acceptance of some of the issues that we're talking today around the ability of humanitarian organizations to operate. Now, most discussions of humanitarian space tend to focus on external challenges. So they'll highlight the, um, the emerging role of stabilization and the use of aid to promote security. Um, they'll talk about counter-terrorism legislation and how it's impacting the ability of organizations to be neutral and impartial. Um, they'll talk about integrated missions and how it's subordinating humanitarian action to the political imperative of the UN and they'll also talk about the actions of states and non-state armed actors that don't respect IHL such as the Sudanese government or rebel groups such as Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Now these external challenges are certainly important and I'm going to pass on to, um, to Sara who's going to talk a little bit particularly about the counter-terrorism legislation and integrated missions but then I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the internal challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit about well what 
what does the humanitarian system look like? What are some of the key characteristics of the humanitarian system? And is it there that perhaps we'll see some of the greater challenges to humanitarian space rather than some of the external issues? But I'll pass it on to Sarah first. Thanks, I mean, I think you know, that's what we've been trying to do with our work on humanitarian space, try and you know, interrogate the various dimensions of the debate you know, that have, are usually presented as just an attack from the outside um, that is sort of you know, kind of put pressure on the humanitarian system and its ability to operate. Um, and the fact that you know, all these um, issues that Samir has been talking about, you know, stabilization, counterterrorism, integration, are all seen as actions or you know, processes um, that restrict the ability of humanitarian actors to operate. Um, Counterterrorism legislation has definitely had this impact. So I'll talk about this first, and then you know I'll, I'll reflect a bit on the integration. Um, that's one thing there. You know I think where one dimension, one area where I guess you know a lot of the. Um, the perceptions of humanitarian actors and the actual bearing of the policies can be seen as having an immediate, um, you know, a direct consequence in terms of its ability to operate according to principles um, of humanitarian action. Um, you probably familiar with counterterrorism legislation both in this country as well as you know in the U.S., in Australia, in the U.K., and other and other places. This laws and regulations have been in place for a number of years, actually before 9-11, but it's definitely been a tightening of, uh, of these uh, laws and regulations after 9-11. Um, and definitely, you know, more interest in making sure that these laws were applied. And of course, you know, these have also been re reflected in terms of uh, UN policies for um, a number of uh, organizations and individuals. Um, what has really changed the game, though, has been a couple of years ago, uh, it was in the summer of 2010, when uh, um, the U.S. Supreme Court made um, passed a decision in a case that had been you know, brought to the Supreme Court by the Humanitarian Law Project. It's a case called the Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. The Humanitarian Law Project wanted to train two proscribed groups. I think it was L. TTE and Karima was the, the other PKK. one and PPK, PKK in uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law, and. It, you know, it basically uh, took forward a pre-enforcement challenge, it's called, of, you know, the domestic statute that regulates um, counter-terrorism um, to, to check whether, you know, providing what is called material support to proscribed organizations was constitutional or not. To explain in a sort of uh, non sort of legal language, they basically said, is it possible that you know, if you want to train a, a proscribed organization in IHL and IHRL, this actually constitutes a violation of you know, the, the, um, the laws and you know, is, is this kind of deemed as a criminal, criminal act? Now, the US Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the statute, basically said, yes, if you're training these groups, you are providing material support, because even training constitutes material support. Despite the fact that this is training in IHL, you're actually trying to make sure that these groups can comply with international humanitarian law, is still seen as providing them with you know, some capacity support. So you are actually liable, um, you're committing a, you know, a criminal act, a criminal offense. Now, this has had an enormous repercussion in the humanitarian world because obviously a lot of organizations on the ground engage in uh, you know, discussions. With, and it was also because it was not just you know, the, the discussion about the training per se, but material support was interpreted more widely in any kind of sustained engagement with these groups that could be seen as, can, could be construed as material support. Um, of course, you know, for organizations and individuals operating in South Central Somalia, where there is Al-Shabaab, which is a proscribed group, or in Gaza, where Hamas is a proscribed group, as well as many other places, this meant that they could be, you know, sort of actually liable personally for any engagement with these groups. And U.S. legislation can actually be applied to non-U.S. citizens and extraterritorially. So it, 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 you can be liable anywhere you are for whatever you are. If you pass through the U.S., you can basically be arrested if you deem to have um, supported, you know, terrorism through your through providing material support to these groups. So, of course, there was a lot of reflection internally by humanitarian organisations about the repercussions of this legislation and what it meant. Also, because unlike the UK legislation, for instance, there was no limitation. In, for instance, in the UK legislation, you need to have the intention to benefit a group, whereas the US legislation does not have um, this proviso. You know, you're liable whether you. Uh, intended to, sub to benefit a prescribed group or not. 
And at this point, we decided that actually we had to investigate you know, the issue a bit more, a bit in more depth, and realized that the biggest um, impact that the legislation had was not actually in terms of uh, you know, the personal liability of individuals or organizations. Very few humanitarian actors have been arrested or prosecuted as a result of the legislation, although there have been cases like the Holy Land Foundation in the US where or the Board of Trustees was actually you know, um, put on trial and um, in jail uh, afterwards because through the action of the foundation there had been benefit to um, groups in the Gaza Strip associated with Hamas. Now one can discuss on you know, the humanitarian nature of the action of the Holy Land Foundation but there are examples where the legislation has been applied. However, we you know, doing more analysis of these issues where the impact has been more profound has not been in terms of the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of personal or organizational liability, but it's been on a number of different areas. We sort of um, highlighted five uh, different areas. The first one has been the decrease in funding for organizations, for humanitarian organizations working um, in areas in context you know, where there are um, proscribed groups or where they're seen as potentially benefiting proscribed groups. For instance, Islamic organizations have seen a significant shrinking of their funding base um, because um, private donors, you know, people who contribute to charities, have felt that perhaps they could indirectly uh, through the organizations they're contributing to benefit proscribed groups and therefore be liable. Likewise, you know, governments have not um, funded these organizations because you know, they were not sure about their links with uh, um, um, proscribed groups. And actually, uh, this has, has led on the ground to the shutting down of a lot of operations you know, for um, large Islamic organizations as well as smaller ones that, for instance, supported orphans in Gaza, you know, little child, child charitable organizations that actually did have uh, quite important uh, um, relief programs in a number of, um, of countries. Uh, the other area, and, and of course, you know, the, this has led also in areas like you know, South Central Somalia to less and less organizations being engaged on the ground because of you know, being, first of all, unable in terms of, uh, of funding or because of the fear that funding could be misappropriated by prescribed groups and therefore bring a liability for the organization. The other issue is, uh, the other big areas of impact has been around uh, um, administration. The administrative burden that these uh, uh, laws and regulations have, Im have imposed on organizations. Because obviously, organizations have had to be a lot more rigorous in demonstrating how the funding was used, which you know, groups, which communities was benefiting, who in the community, how. And all of this has actually really affected the timeliness and efficiencies of humanitarian action. Um, that has been, again, you know, in the case of Somalia, a large part of the problem in this disbursing funding, actually using the funds quickly enough, even where funds were ma made available, because you know there was a lot of um, uh, delays on the transactions. Again, Islamic organisations are finding very, very difficult to transfer money fast enough to their country offices. You know, banks very often stop their funds to do extra checks. Uh, they can freeze them for months and ends and you know, then release them. And they also have to bear the charges for all the delays um, while they do the investigation. So it's really severely restricted their capacity to, um, to operate. Um, and all of this, you know, despite the fact that many of these organizations do have risk mitigating procedures in place, but they're not seen by the donors as being sufficient enough um, to comply with the legislation that is in place. The third area has been around um, the the relation with the beneficiaries, because a lot of the, the, the laws and regulations that different countries have in place um, require extensive vetting of the beneficiaries, you know, and, and very kind of detailed um, feedback and, you know, to the filling of the database uh, with personal information on partners, on contractor staff, as well as partners of partners, all sorts of kind of information, you know, disclosure that is actually seen by organizations on the, gr on the ground and, and individuals as very invasive and accusatory. And of course, undermines the trust between the humanitarian organizations and the partners in the communities with which they have to operate. Um, now, this is very much seen as, you know, um, something that undermines the neutrality of humanitarian organizations and obviously makes their acceptance a lot harder to achieve. So 
sort of going back to what Samir was saying in terms of the impact on humanitarian space and the ability of organizations to operate in terms of you know, adherence to principles of uh, um, um, humanitarian action, this is definitely does have a very direct bearing. Um, there are organizations that have refused to accept these clauses. You know, MSF is a case in point where they've, uh, we know that you know, consistently they have either refused to sign these clauses or you know, reformulated the clauses in a way that you know, sort of said very clearly, um, I, mean, I quote, uh, the, the nothing in donor agreements could prevent MSF from fulfilling its mission as an impartial humanitarian actor bound by medical ethics. So they've made sure to put a proviso in every agreement. But it's not clear to what extent other humanitarian um, actors have maintained you know, the same principled engagement or have you know, succumbed to the pressure by the donors to um, kind of comply with the regulations. And that leads me to the fourth failure, which is really in terms of transparency, because the policies are not very clear. Um, what the organizations do is not very clear or transparently shared. So there is a whole you know, um, uh, atmosphere of kind of mistrust and miscommunication around these issues, which has led to you know, this famous don't ask, don't tell policy. So if you ask a donor to clarify what the legislation say, very often you get back better not to ask me because otherwise I have to put you know, in writing exactly what the restrictions are and you don't want to have that because that is going to be worse for you. And so of course you know, where there is this lack of clarity and transparency uh, that just fuels you know, this climate of, of uh, mistrust and leads to less accountability. I mean what we have seen for instance um, you know, in, in, in Gaza is uh, me uh, and in other places uh, meetings of uh, uh, you know cluster uh, coordination meetings not been minuted because um, otherwise you know it would transpire that there has been engagement with Hamas or with part of the local authority they are prescribed and so actually it leads to less accountability than you know if you would report <laughs> transparently what you have been doing and the other you know direct consequence has been that obviously there has been an, a move towards cash donation you know, towards to giving money you know to briefcase NGOs that would take the money directly to the country rather than going through channels you know th that would go to banking transactions because that um, obviously doesn't leave any trace um, behind. And the fifth area has really been around the issue of coordination again because of the fear of criminalization of staff or pro potential prosecution of staff agencies have generally been very reluctant to say what they have or have not done you know, in this context, but also to share um, the extent to which they've been complying with donor policies and regulations on these issues because you know, I think the suspicion is that many have not been operating in compliance with principles of humanitarian action. And any, uh, there has been a number of uh, initiatives at the level of the ISC, you know, Samir was quoting the ISC, the Intelligence Standing Committee, to try and understand a bit more what is the common practice, and hardly anybody has been feeding into these you know, surveys or communicating exactly what they were doing because um, of the sensitivity of this information. So this is just to give you, you know, a little flavor of the, the, ex the extent of this uh, um, the impact of uh, counter-terrorist policies on the action. The other area where I'm going to touch briefly is on uh, um, the issue of integration, you know, integrated missions. And that's again another one where the assumption is that in the, uh, when you have integrated missions, which means that you know, the political, within a UN structure, um, the political uh, pillar, the peacekeeping pillar, and the humanitarian pillar are all together in one integrated uh, um, mission. That is inevitably seen as restricting the ability of humanitarian actors, you know, obviously humanitarian actors within the UN, to operate in accordance to principles of humanitarian action and restricting humanitarian space. Now, Samir, with others in the team, have been doing a long, very detailed study on integrated mission and the way in which it, um, you know, in, uh, impacts on humanitarian space. And actually, you know, the evidence is mixed. I mean, it's not. Uh, the jury is really out, you know, to what extent just uh, the mere issue of integration impacts on humanitarian space or is actually other factors, you know, that have a bearing more than, in, you know, the integrated mission per se. Um, uh, Samir and the team have been working on uh, five particular areas of humanitarian space. One has been the safety of humanitarian workers, access, engagement with non-state actors, 
perceptions of humanitarian workers and humanitarian advocacy. I'll touch just on the first three in the interest of time, then we can you know, touch on others in the discussion. But just to say, you know, the study focused on DRC, Afghanistan, and Somalia, and then there were other desk studies in Darfur, CAR, and, um, and Liberia. And I think what comes out of the study you know, more uh, um, very strongly is that, first of all, um, any debate on these issues is incredibly polarized. You know, there is a pro-camp and against camp. You know, there is obviously the peacekeeping community that very much feels that you know integrated missions uh, does not constitute a challenge to humanitarian space in any way. Um, whereas you know humanitarian actors, particularly uh, from the NGO community, almost on principle object to the idea of integration because they maintain that it has an adverse impact on humanitarian space. Obviously, the climate of mistrust does not allow you know, the policy and integration to even have a chance to be <laughs> implemented properly. And what emerges from the study is that actually what, uh, what is more critical than integration per se is the context in which integration takes place. The context has a bearing on humanitarian space and the ability of humanitarian actors to operate much more than integrated missions per se. Obviously, if the policy was implemented adequately, appropriately, um, it would have to be tailored to the different contexts. And you know, the policy does say very clearly that depending on the context, there would have to be different arrangements in terms of visibility, in terms of you know, the kind of um, structure or non-structural arrangement that you put in place for integration. But just you know, looking at the three areas that, uh, um, three of the five areas that I was gonna mention, for instance, around the security of humanitarian workers, and Samir can give you more examples, it definitely did not, you know, there was not enough evidence to conclude that integration per se constitutes um, an additional factor of risk for humanitarian actors um, in, in, in a number of environments. However, the study also found that in certain environments, highly you know, visible integration arrangements may pose an additional risk. And you know, that's something that um, organize, uh, the, the UN obviously needs to bear in mind when deciding the shape that the mission will take in the different contexts. But integration per se was not seen as actually big a direct factor you know, of uh, um, additional insecurity for humanitarian workers in, um, in this country. I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Well, just to say that in those contexts where highly visible integration arrangements can be a risk factor, it's usually those contexts where the role of the UN is actually being contested by one or more of the belligerents, but also those belligerents are able to distinguish between humanitarian actors. And we found that in those contexts, highly visible integration arrangements can pose additional risks for humanitarian workers. The other issues around access, and again, you know, the, the, the assumption very often has been that just being part of an integrated mission reduces your access, um, also because you know it makes your approach more risk adverse. Again, that has also come out with mixed evidence. There is actually areas where just being able to rely on the political and military assets of the mission has increased access rather than decreased it. But you know, in other contexts, this has not been the case. There has definitely been more restriction, you know, to movement and access. And finally, in terms of engagement with no state actors, again, we see a very mixed picture. You know, there are areas where. Um, I mean, there is no area, no, no context where there is a formal no-contact policies with armed non-state actors. But again, we see a mixture of situations. Somewhere there is a, an almost kind of a quiet, you know, sort of, or, or some discouragement to engage with armed non-state actors, where they're seen as, for instance, being a threat to a peace process or, you know, engagement with uh, an established authority. You know, for instance, the TFG in Somalia. But there are also areas where the type of analysis that an integrating mission is, is able to provide you know, through the political affairs um, officers and you know, the kind of more sophisticated, detailed analytical work has actually provided an element you know, of benefit to humanitarian actors because it's expanded their analysis and understanding of armed and state actors. Um, so just to say that, you know, again, the picture is very mixture in terms of you know, this, the, the challenge that these external processes bring onto humanitarian space. But some will reflect more on the internal challenges, which I think are you know, more interesting. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, just briefly, I mean, I think, I think it's important to say that, you know, 
the issues that Sarah just outlined with regards to counter-terrorism legislation, with regard to increased emissions, are very real, and it's not that the focus on there is misguided. But what we're trying to say is that when I'm trying to look at the challenges to humanitarian space, we also need to reflect a little bit more on the humanitarian system per se. Now, there is in fact very little reflection on the nature of that system. I think we often see humanitarian organizations generally lacking power, the fact that they're outside of politics, and that they're largely <coughs> operating in conflict zones against the odd, odds only really armed with its humanity. And I think if you take a cl closer look at the humanitarian system, you'll actually find that it's a very important source of power. P um, it wields considerable resources, particularly when you compare it to some of the governments that lack empirical sovereignty, such as governments in Somalia, such as governments in Haiti. In fact, you could argue that the aid system itself exercises in some of these contexts a competing source of sovereignty, which more often than not tends to bypass the state and indigenous structures. Um, so to give you an example, um, Amy Slaughter and Jess Crisp from UNHCR reviewed UNHCR's care and maintenance model and they observed how the organization and I quote endowed UNHCR with the responsibility for establishment of systems and services for refugees that were parallel to separate from and in many cases better resourced than those available to the local population this created a widespread perception that the organization was a surrogate state complete with its own territory those are the refugee camps its citizens the refugees public services such as education, healthcare, water, sanitation, etc., and even ideology, community participation, gender equality. So in a sense, the humanitarian system itself can at times have a competing form of sovereignty. Now that sovereignty can also have a physical manifestation, what Mark Duffield often calls the fortified aid compound. So humanitarian organizations, particularly those of the UN, are increasingly located in high, behind high walls, behind barbed wire, and often use military escorts and private security in order to ensure their access and their ability to operate. And if you look at these big fortified aid compounds in places such as Haiti, in places such as Pakistan, in Somalia, you might be forgiven from looking at it from the outside, if you see quite an exclusive and powerful system. So in Haiti after the earthquake, Haitian nationals were not allowed to enter UN compounds due to security concerns, which effectively meant that Haitians couldn't participate in the coordination meetings. And I think this is a far cry from the, albeit slightly romanticized, humanitarianism from the 70s and 80s, which very much had a strong emphasis on volunteerism and integration with local communities. Um, I think the system's sovereignty also takes on other important characteristics. It is also dominated by a small number of organizations. So despite the, um, the discourse of universality of humanitarianism, um, according to ALNAP State of the Humanitarian System Report, six NGOs, which is CARE, Catholic Relief Services, Oxfam, World Vision, Save the Children, and MSF, they account for 1.7 billion of humanitarian spend and a workforce of 90,000 people. Now, at a round table earlier this year, this was referred to as a humanitarian cartel, in the sense that there's very limited scope for entry. MSF is the only organization to have entered that group in the last 40 years. Furthermore, career paths often span these few organizations, creating, if you like, a humanitarian establishment whose discourse essentially shapes the collective memory of humanitarianism, its own history, and also define and legitimizes the meaning and scope of humanitarian action. So, for example, when Turkey was involved, um, Turkish NGO was involved in the Gaza flotilla incident a few years ago, the fact that they called themselves a humanitarian action, an actor was seen very much as heresy amongst the humanitarian community, despite the fact that if you look at humanitarian, um, the humanitarian NGO's own history, their political solidarity with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua or with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan shows that that kind of solidarity is not necessarily so detached from the history of humanitarian action. Um, also, those barriers to entry within the system are reinforced by the creation of initiatives and reforms such as sphere standards and the custom system. Now, whilst these um, initiatives are very much being developed to improve the effectiveness of um, humanitarian response, they can have the adverse effect of marginalizing and excluding other actors and networks that are involved in humanitarian action, but are not recognized as established and legitimate or equal by the establishment, such as national organizations, diaspora 
organizations, religious-based organizations. It's interesting, we came back this morning from an interesting discussion with um, the Sudan task force here in the Canadian government, and they were saying how in South Korea, the finance in Sudan, they very much knew that international organizations were not present and that there are national organizations um, actually on the ground, but their ability to fund them is very limited because they're not forming part of the actual established system and therefore are not really sure how they can actually channel their money to them. Um, so despite the language of local ownership and partnership, I think the tendency for most big NGOs really is to assimilate or co-opt national organizations. It's quite striking how most national NGOs um, and local partners often adapt the language and terminology of international organizations and UN agencies rather than vice versa. I was doing some research in Pakistan um, um, last year and I think what was quite striking speaking to, na um, to national organizations who very much did not have a humanitarian background, most of them had been working or established in, um, in areas of development or, um, or um, community <coughs> counter radicalization, trying to get youth out of extremist um, environments, very much used the same language language as international organizations on humanitarian space and humanitarian principles, rather than some of the INGOs really adapting their language to the local context. Um, I think another important characteristic of the humanitarian system is that it's also predominantly Western and increasingly governmentalized. So most of the largest NGOs have their headquarters in North America or um, Western Europe, and all the biggest government donors are mainly Western except for Japan and a few of what we tend to call emerging actors. So, um, also, despite claims of autonomy of the humanitarian actors and the importance of independence, most organizations are very much dependent on government funds. Um, I, was re I was recently at an OCHA conference, a policy conference in December, and one of the donors very much admitted that they very much drive the system and the way it operates because they are in charge of the funds. Um, and I think that the counter-terrorism issue actually shows the extent to which many humanitarian organizations have acquiesced very much to government demands even when they clearly violate core humanitarian principles. Um, and in that regard, I think the term non-governmental organization in certain contexts become a slight misnomer. Um, Therefore, I think maybe there should be less surprise when an organization like Al-Shabaab in Somalia perceives organizations as Western spies um, for governments. Um, the Sudanese government has also said uses a similar language when talking about Western NGOs. And in Sri Lanka, the Sinhala local media very much depicted NGOs um, who frequently met in what they called a coffee club as neo-colonialists conspiring against the government. And I think we often have a lot of shock amongst the humanitarian community when they hear these reports, but I think with more reflection on the way the system actually operates and the way it looks, actually we should perhaps be less surprised that those, um, some of these actors have those views. The paradox, I think, however, is that despite this image of power and competing sovereignty, the system is actually weak and fragmented. So the system is actually not really a system in that it's very loosely configured. There lacks any explicit or overarching rules-based regime. Um, the actors are self-regulating. There is no common definition of what humanitarianism is. And whilst they often come together to forge common positions or standards, such as spheres or the NGO um, conduct on um, code of conduct for humanitarian principles, these are often frequently adhered to more in the breach than in the actual observance. And I think Pakistan was quite an eye-opener for myself, where basic operating rules after the IDP crisis in 2009 were put together to ensure that humanitarian organizations operated to clear um, to humanitarian principles. But these were very much disregarded very quickly. And any discussion that we had with humanitarian organizations, there no one even really mentioned the rules. And it was clear that there was many divisions amongst the humanitarian system around adherence to principles and the way in which they engage with the Pakistani military and the Pakistani government. Um, and I think the fragmentation we often see amongst the humanitarian system is partly explained by competitive market imperatives for funds, for public profile, for market share, and for niche expansion. And I think these market dynamics and the need to be seen to be present in the midst of conflict zones is part of the reason why there's such concern at this perceived shrinking of humanitarian space. 
because more and more humanitarian organizations, they need to show to their people that fund, to their private donors, to donors that they can operate in the middle of conflict zones. And they will expect that. And in fact, the current paradigm in operational security management is very much how to stay as opposed to when to leave. So presence and proximity in these conflict zones has become really important goals, but without sometimes asking at what price. So in order to stay and deliver, we see organizations often transferring risks to national staff and national organizations, so using remote management types of operations. They often use armed escorts, and they continue programming with little ability to actually effectively evaluate and monitor their programs. And I think this paradigm is very much reinforced by the tendency to focus on agency space as opposed to effective, effective community space. And I think that came out very much in Sri Lanka, where it was clear that affected communities were not able to receive protection. So we tragically saw 30 to 40,000 civilians die in the last phases of the war in 2008. And the silence that most humanitarian organizations um, had on this issue was very much justified on the need to maintain an extremely limited presence. And I think that if the paradigm was slightly shifted around rather than how to stay and deliver in those contexts but actually when to leave and when does the situation become unsustainable I think perhaps most humanitarian organizations reflecting back would probably have left Sri Lanka and not stayed until the end um, so really in conclusion I think there needs to be much more internal reflection to better understand what a crisis of acceptance actually means. So yes, it's true that there are extremely important external challenges affecting the ability of humanitarian organizations to operate and real reasons to be concerned around politicization, securitization, and counterterrorism measures. But at the same time, I think that if we are really going to try to push for greater acceptance in many of these contexts, there needs to be a move away from just focusing on aid agency access, but saying, well, what does a humanitarian space that puts welfare affected communities at the heart of the concept actually mean? And I think if we do do that, I think the discourse of humanitarian space will have to radically shift. And I think we need to start thinking about what does a more universal form of humanitarianism means. And in places such as Somalia, where Western actors cannot really access many populations, what other forms of engagement can be put in place in order to ensure that affected communities are able to receive both protection and humanitarian assistance. But I'll finish it there, but happy to expand on any points or to answer any questions that you may have.